The chairs have changed, but the pitch of the room is pretty much the same. So it's always a pleasure to come back uh, here and to be with folks from Harvard and other folks. And it's nice to see uh, more interesting colors in the audience. I'm a molecular biologist by training. I've been a neuroscientist and a cell biologist and an endocrinologist because molecular biologists had only a little time when it was a science and a field. And now it has become, of course, a tool. And we were considered the Huns because we went forth and basically introduced molecular biology into the study of all systems. And so I kind of got used very early to being considered a Hun. I've been interested in this issue of retention of women and minorities in the STEM fields, science, technology, engineering, and medicine, for a very long time. I think it probably started when I was in high school, about the same time as Shirley, when I, National Science Foundation in those days had something that they called a uh, Opportunities in Science or something, I don't remember. It was a summer science training program. So I got on a bus and I went to Tyler, Texas, and with other high school students, uh, most of them of color, we were a very diverse group. It was a, a truly integrated group. I got to play, uh, do adrenalectomies and find out the consequences of inept surgery, uh, got better at it, found out what happened if you adrenalized a rat, and had a wonderful time. It was also an introduction where on the bus as we crossed certain borders, there were signs that said, welcome, county with the darkest earth and the whitest people. And it was a time when in that first week uh, at Tyler, Texas, we could not find as a group a church that all of us, the blacks, the browns, and the whites, could go to together on Sunday morning. Uh, and so, you know, things have changed a bit. I grew up in Santa Fe, New Mexico, as part of a very large Mexican-American family. And in Santa Fe, there were very few blacks. There were a lot of Hispanics and whites and, and uh, Native Americans. And so I have been asked in the past if I was at a uh, segregated school, because if you look at the high school picture, a lot of us are Mexican-American. Not all of us got out. And I decided at about the age of nine that I wanted to be a scientist. I have never, ever, ever wanted to be a doctor. <laughs> Probably that's because uh, if you are the eldest of six children and you have a lot of cousins, like over 100 first cousins, then you are a caretaker, and that's not really how you want to spend your life, maybe. But I made up for it because I'm in a mixed marriage. I'm a PhD. My husband is an MD. <laughs> well, I spent much of my career, this issue has always been a part of my activities during my career. But it has, I must say, been somewhat peripheral. And, and that's partly of necessity. If you really want to succeed in either academic medicine or, or science, then you really do have to pay attention to uh, the business at hand in order to get ahead. Now that I am less, less uh, I don't have a day job, basically, then there is time to begin to consider how you would like to spend the last segment of time and where attention should go. And so I decided that I would like to understand more deeply why it is that we have been at this for so long. And although we have made progress, and it's real progress, if you go back and read the histories and you think about the times 30 and 40 and 50 years ago, there have definitely been changes and things are better. But we haven't made nearly as much progress as one would think we might, given that overt racism is much reduced, although certainly not gone, in this country. And in institutions across the country, there is a real feeling that perhaps we should be making more progress. And there is a lot of attention to the issue, and you hear a lot of talk about it. But somehow, the numbers really don't change all that fast. And so I became interested in the issue of why this is so, and I came to a realization. Being a molecular biologist and a hard scientist trained at MIT and being here for a period of time, that um, the so-called hard sciences haven't really paid a whole lot of attention to those areas which might inform us about how we think and why we make certain decisions. And so partly as a result of a workshop that I'll discuss a little bit, I uh, began to understand that perhaps this was important rigorous and needed to be paid attention to. And so what I'm going to tell you today is a little bit about what I've learned um, about both why we have gone so slowly, I think, 
uh, a theory of how the human mind works and what that means for our decision making and choosing our colleagues and our students, um, and the impact that's had, and maybe a little bit of what we can do about it. So much of what I'm going to tell you can be summarized, and for me was summarized, in these three books. Primarily Kahneman's book, Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky began about 40 years ago to decide to try to understand how people make financial decisions. He is a behavioral ec economist. He won the Nobel Prize for this. Tversky would have uh, shared it with him, but he unfortunately died. And so Daniel Kahneman in this book summarizes some really beautiful work over a very long period of time with elegant and simple experiments where you ask people questions and then you ask them the same question, but it's phrased in a different way, and see what their responses are. And by doing this kind of experiment, nothing like Hershey Heaven, man, find an experiment and repeat it and repeat it and repeat it. They learned a lot about decision making. And in this book, Kahneman puts forward a theory, a model of how the human mind works. And this, I like being an experimental scientist. I like models. You can test them. Uh, if it's a model that you can't test, it's not useful. The model made immediate sense to me. Um, when you think about it, the human mind is quite remarkable, this bit of stuff here. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. But it's not, it's a machine that, it, it's, a, it's an entity that's getting an enormous amount of input. And um, it has to deal with that. There's more, it's big data. It's the original big data problem. More information than the mechanism can deal with. And so that you had to, we had to evolve ways of dealing with that. Blind Spot by uh, Benagere and Greenwald is a story about the consequences of this kind, of some of the, the results of the way that human beings tend to think. Um, some of the biases that arise that human beings have and are not aware of necessarily. And Whistling Vivaldi is a very interesting book by Claude Steele, which he was interested in the question of the uh, black white academic gap. And he spent his career studying that. And this book summarizes that. And I'll come to it a little bit as well. So you will all know this. But the mind does a lot of its work automatically. It does it unconsciously. And we, don't, we cannot help what we do. So when we encounter information, when information comes in through our senses, we respond to it immediately with related information just comes and there's a response which we have absolutely no control over. It is automatic response to the stimulation that we get. And Kahneman says that you know most of the time this works. Um, we don't have to spend a whole lot of energy, and we make decisions very rapidly, and that's fine. We are uh, we are we allow ourselves our impressions and our feelings and our intuitive beliefs to guide our decisions, and much of the time that works. But some of the times it doesn't work. And unfortunately, we are very confident of our decisions, even when we're wrong. So the way he explains this is to say that there are really two systems of thinking. And this is, draws from a great deal of work that preceded Kahneman and, and continued uh, parallel to his work, where there's an automatic or intuitive way of thinking, which he calls system one, that is automatic and quick. And it requires very little effort. You don't expend a lot of energy in making these decisions. There's no control over it. You cannot control this particular response. And it runs all the time. It just goes all the time. And then there's system two, which is deliberate and controlled. This is the system where you have to think about things. It's very orderly. It's deliberative. And it usually is, goes along in a low comfort mode. And generally, it accepts whatever system one suggests, because it's lazy. <laughs> However, that's not necessarily a bad thing, and I'll come to that. System one comes in two pieces, really. There's things that are very deeply ingrained into the, the brain. Some of those things are our ability to perceive the world. Obviously, any entity of any sentience whatsoever must interact with the world outside itself in order to survive. So we are born, in fact, even before we're born, we're, we can recognize things in the world. We can perceive the world. We recognize novelty. And novelty is a bad thing if you're out in a hostile world. Novelty is bad, a potential threat. And so you have to recognize threats. Even chickens right out of the egg do not like spiders. It is a, a, the uh, aversion to spiders is deeply ingrained in vertebrates. 
uh, and even in lower creatures. Uh, have you seen, you may have seen cat videos where cats respond uh, by jumping up in response to a cucumber that they hadn't realized was there. And that's probably their aversion to snakes, which is also very deeply ingrained. But some of these automatic mental activities are learned. We learn them, and they become very fast and automatic because the human brain has to deal with a lot of information. And so as it develops in the world, in its culture, in its society, there are things that it learns that it says, OK, this is the way the world is. This is how I'm going to respond to it, and I don't have to think about it anymore. And they become very, that becomes part of system one thinking. And practice or exposure can do that. So that an expert violinist doesn't have to think to go into the correct position. A pianist, very quickly, does not have to think about where the notes are on the keys. His fingers know. Um, and he will go there. He sees the note, it goes there. That becomes automatic and does not require conscious thought. With this, though, it means that when we see someone in front of us, our society has ingrained upon us a response to that individual based on what the culture thinks it knows about how people are. Um, and so we will have an immediate association when we see something. And, further, and this will bring other, there are other biases like this that we'll discuss as we go. So implicit bias is a reflexive thinking that results from our milieu. It's the mental content, and we're not aware of it. And it is acting in all of us. It is not restricted to any particular uh, race or gender. It is general. All human beings do this. These hidden biases can guide our behavior. And really well-intentioned people, good people, will be acting in a way which is contrary to what they think they believe. You can learn a great deal about this by going to the implicit bias side at Harvard University that Manasia and, and Greenwald set up. And there are a large number of implicit bias tests. It is humbling and extraordinarily enlightening to take that test, any one of them. You can pick gender, you can pick race, you can pick education, you can, there's a number of them. I uh, encourage it. So these are some examples of system one at work. If I say a sentence you cannot, in your native tongue, you cannot misunderstand it. A simple sentence in your native tongue, you will understand. And you don't have to think about it. You just understand it. If I say one and one, you know that's two. And you don't think about it. It just is two. And when I say Paris, you know that that's the capital of France, because you have grown up knowing that. Another way of looking at it is the perceptual errors that the mind can make. So some of you may know Shepard's work, but for, those, for anyone actually in the audience, how many of you think that those two tables are the same, tabletops are the same size? Come on now, tell me, raise your hand. Are they the same size or not? Cowards. <laughs> well, we can test it. Let's trace the table and then rotate that trace and impose it upon the other table. And we can see that, yes, they are exactly the same size. And this is not a bad thing. This is actually wondrous, because what it represents is the adaptation of a two-dimensional visual system. Light falls upon a pretty flat retina. But the mind knows that the world out there is three-dimensional. And so the mind interprets the two-dimensional data as three-dimensional, period. And even when you know that those two tops are the same size, you cannot see them as a different as the same size. You will continue to make that perceptual error. The same is true in associative thinking. Just like we make perceptual errors because of the minds, the way the mind has adapted to thinking about the world, we also make associative errors. As we grow, certain things are always connected. And we, those become part of system one thinking. So when we think of in the general population, germ, cold, bad thing. Limes are always green. If we see something orange that is lime-shaped, we think of it as a small orange, not a lime. An apple is a fruit. When an idea is presented to you, I say dog, that will arise in all of your minds, a whole bunch of associations, some good, some bad, some that you'll think about, some that you won't. And that will mean that you will have a response to that term, which is both unique to each of you but also has some shared things in common. 
These associations result in something that the, the sociologists and psychologists call priming. So that if I say eat, you will complete that SOP, you, there will be a tendency to complete it as soup rather than soap. Whereas if we're talking about showers and bathtubs and stuff like that, you would have a tendency to complete that as soap and not soup. The key thing is that actions and emotions can be keyed by events that we're not really aware of. And one of my favorite examples is an experiment. You know, many experiments in sociology and psychology are done with undergraduates. Um, in this particular experiment, students were called in for their sociology thing, and they were told that this was a word association test, and they were put in a room, and they were given some association test with a group of words, all of which had to do with aging, or which had to do with something else, fruit or animals or some such. And so those students that had been dealing with words that had to do with aging, you know, infirm, sick, crippled, uh, uh, blind, all of these words, elderly, needs assistance, all of those kinds of words. After a while, the students were told, one at a time, um, you know, there's a room down the hall, and in that room there's some cookies and some drinks. Why don't you go and take a break and get refreshed? And that's when the real experiment was done, because what the experimenters did was to measure the pace at which those students walked from the test room to the cookies. And what they found, and of course these are experiments, so they're repeated, so you have numbers that are statistically significant, is that those students had been dealing, these are college, healthy college students, by the way, when these students who'd been dealing with words like, uh, that related to infirmness or elderliness, walked more slowly to go get the cookies than students that had been dealing with words otherwise. Now let's talk about system two. System two requires work, and it, uh, and it requires attention. And it's a, sort of an interesting little corollary to this. It's a wonderful paper pun, uh, published by Kahneman and his colleagues it, that they noticed that when someone was really concentrating on solving a problem that had been set before them, the pupils dilate. So they did this very clever study where they measured pupillary dilation as a function of different things uh, to see, you know, what. Did it correlate with how hard you were working? And the answer is yes. The more your pupil dilates, the harder it is you're working. Furthermore, you're using a lot of glucose. When you're using system one, it takes energy, whereas system one takes minimal energy. And this has been shown uh, by doing imaging studies. You simply look at glucose, and you see more energy being used when people are doing difficult mental tasks. They also found, as you become skilled at something, it takes less energy. And we all know this. If you practice in something or if you're sitting there learning anatomy, at the beginning when you don't know it, it's tough. And as you begin to know it, it becomes part of your armamentarium and it takes less effort and may even become part of system one. So the other thing is, is that all voluntary effort, it doesn't matter if it's mental, emotional, or physical, draws from the same pool of mental energy. So that if you exhaust yourself by paying attention in classes all day, you will have less energy to emo uh, uh, expend on other things. Emotional uh, response to family, for example, or uh, attention to diet. So you may find, as I do, that you eat more when you're at a meeting. This also may explain why uh, it has turned out that our default mode of thinking is uh, system one. If you have to survive in the world, you really want to conserve energy for those times when you need it. And so it, if you don't have to expend en energy, you are more likely to uh, survive. And so you don't expend energy unless you have to, which is why I said earlier that perhaps laziness is a good thing. It's a survival thing. So these are some things that happen when system two is at work. If you're trying to focus on a single voice in a crowded cocktail party or something, that takes mental energy or mental work. If you count the number of characters on a page, all of the Bs on a page, or all of the numbers on a page of numbers, that takes work, filling out a tax form. Focus on a really difficult task can blind people to what's going on around them. And my favorite example of this is the gorilla uh, experiment. And in this experiment, a group of people are set before a basketball game, two teams, red and blue, 
and the basketball team is passing the ball. This video shows the ball going back and forth. And the test subjects are asked to count the number of times that the basketball ball, ball is passed from one person to another. And they are set to this task. And in the middle of the video, what happens is a woman in a gorilla suit walks out, stands in the middle of the court, and walks off. The majority of people who are trying to count the number of times that the basketball is passed do not see the gorilla. And when you tell them afterwards that there was a gorilla, they will not believe it. They have to go back and look at the video without some mental task and go, oh my god, there was a gorilla. How can you not see the gorilla? And there are a number of other experiments like this that have been done. This too is a survival mechanism. You know, when something is really important and you, you don't want to be distracted by all of the other information which is bombarding your senses. So maintaining focus is really difficult. Uh, you'll know that. And there's sort of this interesting thing that if you're busy at some cognitive task, you may uh, also make some unfortunate decisions, which may account to the unfortunate statements that some individuals have made in various settings when they're uh, doing another thing. Perhaps the one that we're all most familiar with is when Larry Summers was president here and uh, mentioned in a meeting that perhaps women were not uh, capable of doing, biologically capable of doing as well as men in the sciences. Stereotype threat is an interesting uh, thing because for me what it amounts to is the interaction of system two at work in response to system one implicit biases. So stereotype threat is defined, as you see here, as being at risk of confirming as self-characteristic a negative stereotype about one group. So in this country, there is a general belief that women aren't as good as men at math. Women don't score as well on math tests in this country, in fact. Um, and there's, all, there's been this achievement gap between African Americans and white Americans that has been there forever. And People say, why is this happening? These are very bright students. So Claude Steele was very interested in this, and he set about to study it. So he, too, developed some really simple and repeatable and very elegant experiments to try to do this. And his experiment with math, uh, the math gap, was as follows. He took math majors at Princeton, highly selected group, men and women, two groups, in one group, he took the, the graduate students in math into a room and said, we're, we're going to do a math test today. Um, and you know, by the way, you've probably heard that women don't do as well on math tests as men, just mentioning it as part of the background. And then he left, and the test was given. And sure enough, the women underscored the men by the predicted amount as has been found any number of times. He did it again with another group, highly selected men and women, math majors. And he brought them in and said, we're going to give, do a math test today. And you may have heard that men and women, that men, women don't do as well as men on math tests. But I have to tell you, this test was very carefully designed so that this effect would not be there. Very simple. That, that was it. And then he leaves. The students take the test. And the students score equivalently on that test. So we did a variation of this experiment with athletes took black and white athletes, took them to a golf course, and said, we're going to do a golf exercise today, first group. And this golf exercise will reveal to us your ability to think strategically about a game. Black students did not perform as well as the white students in the golf round. The next group of students he brings to the golf course, and he says, we're going to do a golf exercise today. And this exercise will reveal to us something about your native athletic ability. In this case, the white students underperformed relative to the black students in this golf exercise. So of course, one is curious, why is this happening? Now, I told you that system two is limited in the number amount of energy that we have for any given task is limited. And so in a combination of standard psychological testing and in imaging studies, what people have found, what individuals have found, is that when someone, and this only applies, by the way, to very bright, uh, ambitious students who care about their performance. If you don't really care whether you do well academically or not, you will perform badly under any circumstance. It's very difficult to change that. But if you care deeply about your ability to do something, 
when you are faced with a test of that ability, there is a part of your mind that is saying, oh, I really want to do well on this test. I want to be a mathematician. I want to do well on this test. I really want to do well on this test. But maybe I won't do well on this test. Nobody expects me to do well on this test. I'm not supposed to do well on this test. And there is this churning kind of worry about wanting not to be the stereotype and being worried that perhaps there is something to the stereotype and you will reinforce it as, with respect to yourself. That takes energy. And in imaging studies, you can see that there are parts of the mind that are working at odds with each other. And so you are drawing away mental energy, and you just don't have enough resources to focus on the task at hand. And the interventions that you can do for yourself and with other people for yourself to overcome this are not difficult in many cases, but hard to remember to do. And so we have this gap, and there is no recognition that we can do these in many cases. So it becomes a problem. Now, just to illustrate that you know, there really are imaging studies going on, I chose this paper from 2002, uh, seven, sorry, uh, which summarized a great deal of the literature on work trying to figure out where system one and system two, in this paper it's referred to as uh, associative and reflexive thinking occur. And the areas that are outlined uh, and have a white in them are system one, and the areas that have a little black circle around them are system two. And I noted the ventral medial posterior frontal cortex in particular because of a curious experiment in which there were a number of individuals with damage in that area. And uh, it turns out that those individuals show no gender bias whatsoever. Just there you are. The other thing that's associated with that area is that that's the area that lights up as we're making our political associations and decisions. That's also interesting. So the other thing that struck me when I saw this view of the brain with these large areas uh, over it is that you know the brain, that structure there, has as many cells in it as there are stars in the universe. I heard David Potter say that in this room at one point uh, when he was giving a lecture to first year medical students or second year. And a lot of those cells are connected to 100,000 other cells. The connections are complex. And even those cells that are not connected to 100,000 other cells are talking to the cells with which they're associated in a very complicated chemical discussion is going on there. And the whole thing is awash in signals that are coming from somewhere else. So the complexity of what's going on in the mind is totally mind-boggling and uh, very uh, clearly such a representation as this is the very crudest of maps about where activities is showing. But fortunately for scientists and the world at large, highly complex things are often highly ordered. And so we can get some idea of where activities occur with these imaging studies, which to date are still really rather crude instruments. So in summary, psychologists and other social scientists have known for a very long time that humans will make systematic errors in judgment of which they are not aware. And data from a large number of sciences are converging from the neurosciences and other studies that back these studies up. These are not squishy findings. The human brain, we've learned, has evolved to deal with the massive amounts of data that come in every second to a human being through each of our senses. That these mechanisms are the real result of evolution doesn't mean that we cannot change our behavior. We are an adaptive species, and we are a creative species. And so there is no reason to believe that we need to give up because this is evolutionary in nature. Evolution, after all, is change. And there are some evolutionary changes which can happen very rapidly as we're learning more about epigenetics and response to conditions around the physical, the physical world around an organism, we're finding that there are times when evolution can happen very fast. When it's a matter of survival, it's remarkable what can happen. And I would posit that it is a matter of survival for the country and society at large. The other thing which has occurred to me, uh, which actually I know is true because it was true of me, is that scientists in the hard and I put it in quote, sciences, have been really resistant to the notion that unconscious mental decisions can affect the decisions that they make. If I come here or I go to my home institution at MIT and I begin to discuss these things, very often what you hear from very well-meaning and certainly very intelligent people is, 
I am making these decisions on the basis of merit and merit alone. Well, we'll see about that. So the other thing I'm going to talk about is some of the things that I learned in a conference that uh, I co-chaired with Florence Bonner, who was provost at Howard University at the time, and a social scientist. And when the committee that I was on, which was the Committee on Women in Science, Engineering, and Medicine at the National Academy of Sciences, decided that we might want to look at this issue and see what was out there. Florence made the case rather forcefully that I had made earlier, which is that those of us who had gotten together in the sciences to worry about this problem were ignoring a big hunk and heap of relevant information, and maybe we should not do that. And so in this uh, particular workshop, what we did was we commissioned two papers to find out where we were and what it was we didn't know and what we did know. And we also had people come in to uh, educate us about some of these things. And so this is a little bit about what we've learned. First of all, here's the representation of folks in science faculty. And this does not include medicine. Uh, it does include some medicine. This is all of them. And this was a large number a survey that was done by Silvia Hurtado and her colleague. Um, and so here's the distribution. You can see that uh, white men and white women make up about eight, together make up over almost 89% of STEM faculty um, relative to their population, uh, their uh, presence in the population. And this was 2010. Um, here's the numbers for Hispanics and African Americans. They make up toge uh, together, they make up 5.9% of STEM faculty, whereas they are close to almost 30% of the general population. Asians are at 7.4%, which is actually, given their representation in the population, is a little bit of an over-representation. However, if we go look to see, so you say, okay, well, okay, uh, but maybe you know the folks that aren't there, you know, there's big, big country, a lot of people don't get the education that would even make them eligible to think about a faculty position at any kind of university. So perhaps that's really it, and what we need to worry about is those levels. Well, let's go see where these people are. And here you see the rank of these folks over here. And what you can see immediately is that, first of all, white men and men generally are at the upper levels of the professoriate, whereas uh, underrepresented folks, including uh, Asian women and white women, are more highly represented at the lower levels of the um, academic hierarchy. If we just look at the total, total STEM workforce and ask, well, what happened, what's going on there, we can see that over the last 20 years, the, the representation of women and minorities in general in the STEM workforce has gone up pretty nicely. Um, if we bring down the uh, curve for women, we can see that women, white women have done better than minority individuals in terms of the rate of increase of people. So what are the career pathways? That's one of the things we weren't sure about. We always talk about the pipeline, and but what does that mean, and where do people, where do we lose people? And this is what we learned uh, in one of the studies done by uh, Ginther and Kahn, who are in, uh, Kansas, statisticians, a status, both statisticians, and one of them's an economist. Maybe they both are. So this is what we learned. Women of color are as likely as their white counterparts to graduate from high school and start college. If they graduate from college, those women of color, they are as likely as white women graduating to be in a field related to science. However, people of color, and now I've changed because both genders, are less likely than white folk to graduate from college in the first place. And they are less likely to obtain a PhD in science or engineering. In medicine in 2010, the situation is a little bit different. Uh, in, in the sciences, it's pretty sad yet. And furthermore, people of color are much less likely to obtain a position in a tenure track, a tenure track position in a non-minority serving institution. On the other hand, women of color are more likely than white women to be employed in a non-tenure track position. And they are more likely to be employed at a minority serving institution and Interestingly, if a woman of color does get a job at a Research One non-minority serving institution, 
she is more likely than her white counterpart to get tenure. Uh, twice as good to get a position may have something to do with it. But not completely, because men of color are less likely than both white women or white men to get uh, tenure, to achieve tenure than anybody else, pretty much. So then we began to want to know, well, what are the biases that women face? And Joanne Williams has been studying biases against women at, uh, at, the, uh, at Berkeley, at the, at the Hastings Law School. And so she provided us with a summary of both her work and others over a long period of time. And the most potent bias that women face of all kinds is the motherhood bias. It is remarkable how motherhood lowers the competence of a woman in the eyes of everybody. And this is, remember, these innate biases are not simply related to uh, gender. Women feel these same biases against women as well. So the motherhood bias was tested in the following way. If you have two identical CVs, I mean, I mean identical. You send it out to a bunch of people, ask for an evaluation of competence, but on one of them, you note that the woman is a member of the PTA. That's all. Just says other, other affiliations, PTA. And that's the only difference from the other woman's CV. The evaluation of that woman's competence drops by 25% or so. Um, and this is very powerful. Other biases that all women see are the recall bias, where women's mistakes are no noticed more, and they are remembered longer than are mistakes made by men. The attribution bias, if a woman succeeds, it's because she's lucky, not because she's skilled. Guy, he's skilled. Then there's the leniency bias, where biases where men tend to be given a break and women are not. Rules are applied more stringently to women than they are to men. By women as well as men, I want to keep stressing this because this is a human problem. It is not restricted to any one type of us. And there are this, this one is interesting, polarized evaluations. If you are a superstar woman, say Elizabeth Blackburn, Nobel laureate, and you have another Nobel laureate who's a man, Elizabeth will be rated as more competent than, her, than the superstar man. But if you are merely an excellent woman at your job, then you will be evaluated as not as competent as your equivalent male. And this is an interesting one in terms of selection of faculty members and, and uh, students. This is something called reconstructing credentials. So if you have a job description that has several credentials, say educational ex and experience, you have a candidate, the woman has more uh, experience, but her education was, you know, at an A minus institution and he got his, his education at an A plus institution. Then the committee will say, oh, you know, uh, education is really more important for this than is experience, so they will hire the man. On the other hand, if the situation is reversed and she has you know, 10 years of experience, loads of accolades, lots of accomplishments with her experience, but she got her degree at an A minus institution and he got his uh, degree at an A plus institution, but he's only had a year or two, hasn't really had a chance yet to, to fulfill that educational thing, then his ed education will be deemed as more important to the job and the man will be hired. So it's uh, a little problem. Women of color face biases that are in addition to the biases faced by all women, and they differ by uh, ethnicity and race. So that African American women are judged much more harshly than white women or African American men when they make mistakes. They are judged even more harshly than all women. African American women, when they take on a position, are expected to fail. And if they don't fail, it is attributed to something outside the woman's luck or, you know, it was because she's black, we gave it to her. Um, Hispanics appear to be subject to assumptions of even lower competence than African-American women, and that may be because they are also assumed to be new immigrants with all of the negative associations that we have in this country about new immigrants with respect to education and competence. So there's class and competence that goes in there. Asian women are very interesting because they are perceived in one of two ways. Either they are very technically competent but lack leadership skills, or they're very passive, therefore less competent, and of course couldn't be a leader under those conditions anyway. 
So you can, this is on the web, this, these studies. You can go there and see that the, the long period of time that has been done with many kinds of, of uh, questionnaires and so forth, experiments, to, to dig out these implicit biases. And I want to stress again, these are not shown just by men, or uh, they are a, a function of humanness, which I kind of like, because it takes away the, it's not a white, black, white, Hispanic, it's not a white anything problem. It's a human problem. But some of my colleagues have said, well, you know, that may be true, but all of these studies are looking at all these different fields, and they're not hard scientists, the people they're testing or being tested. We've, we're trained to be objective. We're trained, and by God, we are bringing in our folks based on merit and merit alone. Well, let's see about that. Jo Handelsman is a chemist. Uh, she's been a number of places, most recently at Yale, but now she's in the Office of, office of Science and Technology Policy, where she runs the biology division there. So she did a, a simple but rather nice experiment. She asked close to 300 colleagues across the country if they would help her in develop. She was developing a program for undergraduates and wanted to know what they should do in order to be good technicians. So she sent them uh, uh, CVs that were identical, except that one was Janice and one was John, or some other John, uh, woman, man thing. And asked them to simply rate these candidates for competence. Uh, what would you offer this person as a starting uh, salary with these credentials and these papers and this experience? And what, by the way, would they have available to them for mentoring possibilities should they take a job in your lab? Send them off. And what she found was it didn't matter if the professor was an assistant professor or a full professor or something in between, if the professor was a man or a woman, or if the professor was a majority uh, someone or a minority someone. In all cases, the man here in black, was, the men were judged to be more competent than the women. They were judged to be more hireable than the woman. They were offered a higher salary than the woman and there would be more mentoring types of activities available to them. So it ain't restricted to anybody. This is something that we all have to contend with. So is there anything we can do about it? And in brief, yes. And they don't have to be very hard. This is the simplest uh, one, which is the, the chairman of the American Society for Microbiology, the program chair, uh, decided he noticed that there were an awful lot of sessions where there were no female speakers. And he asked Joe, who was sitting next to him, is this a gender thing, bias thing? He said, I don't know. So they tested it. And what they found was that if there was a, uh, if the, the group who put together the session were made up all of men, the probability that there would be a female speaker was lower. If there was even one woman on the selection committee, the, the number of female speakers tended to go up. So, Arturo Casa Duval decided as chairman he would take certain prerogative, and so in putting together the, the selection committees, he made an effort to make sure that women were included in the selection committees. He told the committees, all of them, you know, more than half of our society is made up of women, so we need to have examples for them to let them know they belong in this field, so please keep that in mind as you select speakers. Merit, of course, is a given. Um, and then he just look to see what happened. And this is what happened. 2011 was when he noticed the discrepancy. And what you're looking at here is the, this is the percentage of female speakers if the selection panel was all male or had at least one woman on it. In 2011 and 12, you know, there were more, more women speakers, but those panels had more women on them. Um, this is the year in which he introduced the idea that you should really have more people, more women on the selection committees. And in 2015 was where he had told all the committees, let's, let's, you know, let's worry about this. And in 2015, in one year, the, dis the distinction between panels that were all male selecting some women speakers and women that panels that had, selection panels that had one woman, went away. And the number of women speakers went up in all of those years. All male sessions, the other way, it went down in those years, in one society in one year. So it may be that this, has, this can't be done once. It needs to be repeated because these are so deeply ingrained. But nevertheless, one can have something about it. 
And then I was delighted that you mentioned Molly because she's published a paper now which <coughs> looked directly at the ability to inhibit implicit bias at a big university. And her experiment I really loved because she took all the departments in this very large public university, 92 of them, uh, so over 2,000 faculty, and she made them in pairs. The, the departments were classified by the general discipline, the size of the a department and the college that it was in, and they were paired, and they were randomly allocated. This is a random, uh, uh, this is a clustered, randomized, controlled study. Um, and the intervention was really simple. The members of that department were invited to a two and a half hour workshop, which had been developed over time by folks, to provide information about implicit bias and how it might affect your decision making. Now, in, the, in this paper here, she says that three months afterwards, the people who took part in this felt that their departments were, were it was a better fit for every individual. They were more comfortable raising issues uh, that had to do with both uh, departmental politics and personal issues. So that was good, but what I really like is this. This is the effect on hiring of that two and a half hour thing. Now, what I hadn't said was only a quarter of the faculty who were invited to the workshop showed up. Any of you who know anything about faculty know that you can't tell faculty what to do. You can only invite them and persuade them and hope that they show up. And in this case, the average attendance was about a quarter. And there were, some, there were three departments in which no one showed up. But this, what she looked at was the new faculty hires before the intervention and afterwards. The, uh, before was uh, two years, 2008 to 10, and after was 12 to 14. And you can see that in the experimental group, the hiring of underrepresented minorities went up, whereas in the control, it actually went down. In the hiring of non-white individuals went up, whereas in the control, it went down. Uh, the percent women went way up, whereas in the control, it stayed exactly the same. These aren't big changes, but they are real changes. And one of the things that we do know is small changes sustained over long periods of time have an enormous effect. So yes, we can do something about this, but it takes will. It takes not a lot of effort. You can't ask faculty for a lot of effort outside of their major thing, but you can ask for a two and a half hour workshop. It does take also support from the top. So I come back to my sense that we, you know, this is the standard hierarchy in the uh, experimental sciences, in the, in the hard sciences. I, I, could do I should do this again, actually, for a medical audience, because then we might have neurosurgery over here and uh, family medicine down here, right? But I think we have it backwards. And the reason we have backwards is, is in these sciences, the thing that we place at the top of the heap are those fields where you can actually define every aspect of a problem. You can name, or at least identify, all of the variables, and you can address them in formulas and such like, or simple experiments. Down here, it gets really messy. You cannot identify, in most cases, all of the variables, never mind, put them in some kind of a formula which will lead you to an explanation of what's going on in a particular phenomenon. So this is what I really think we should do, where we should order it by the difficulty of the field. It's not mathematics. It's not even rocket science. It's a lot harder. <laughs> but we really have to make the effort to do this for several reasons. It is not a given that the United States will remain the center of science and medicine in the world. It's changed before, it can change again. The demographics are changing. We cannot depend forever on educating the brightest who are pre-ready for our stringent postgraduate work from other countries because we're not being very welcoming to them either as a country and they are finding reasons to go back home and make their place better and they all are hungry. They would all love to be the center of science and technology in the world. So if we don't recognize these things about how we are as human beings and try to do those simple things we could do about them, then we're, you know, going to have trouble. Thank you.